Turn to Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. <coughs> Share a little, a few thoughts with you this morning on Luke, chapter 12. The Lord lead, I pray He preached me this morning. Help me. Luke, chapter 12. Tonight we'll be jumping right back into the book of Genesis with Mr. Wednesday or two here. Um, We'll catch back up on that, chapter 36, uh, pushing on through chapter 50 there, one of the last, the last uh, part of that. So we're looking forward to the night. Uh, some wonderful stuff in the book of Genesis. Uh, y'all come out for that. That's going to be, uh, that'll be a blessing for us, I believe. Chapter 12 of the Gospel of Luke, beginning in verse 1. In the meantime, when they were gathered together, an innumerable multitude of people, and so much that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Well, that ought to put some fear in us this morning, nothing else. Therefore, whatsoever you have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light. And that which you have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. Mm. My, my, my. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after them that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which after he killeth hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? And not one of them is forgotten before God. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Also I say unto you, Whosoever shall confess me before me and him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be, get, be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. And when they bring you unto the synagogues and unto the magistrates and powers, take you no thought how or what thing you shall answer or what you shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what you ought to say. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak unto my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider of you? And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Let me read a few more verses. You stick with me now. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is it. He that layeth up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word this morning. I pray you'd help me that you'd preach me, Lord Father, that you'd be lifted up. And we can say we've been in the presence of God when we leave this place. God, I just give you the glory for what you're going to do. I pray you'd save some soul this morning. That you'd release someone from bondage. That you'd take burdens off the shoulders, Lord God. That you'd reprove and convict, encourage. Lord, Father, rebuke whatever we need, Lord God. I pray you give it to us this morning. So God, I just thank you for being so good, so merciful to us. And we ask it all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. In the previous chapter, chapter 11, that we didn't read, Christ was being discouraged greatly in His ministry. He was being provoked. If you read verses 53 and 54 of chapter 11, it says that the scribes begin to urge him vehemently. They begin to provoke him. Uh, they begin to lay wait for him. They begin to try to accuse him. Uh, anything they could do to falsely accuse the Lord Jesus in his ministry. Uh, if you look uh, further back, 
In verses 15 and 16 of chapter 11, they <coughs> accused him of doing his miracles by the power of Beelzebub, the devil. Basically is what they were saying. And so Jesus comes to chapter 12 and he's going through some hard times in his ministry. Now Jesus went through some hard times on this earth. Uh, so that he can be a faithful high priest that knows what you're going through. He can relate to your lives. Uh, he's been there. He's had no place to lay his head. He's had no permanent dwelling down here. Uh, he's struggled uh, in many ways just as many of us struggle emotionally, financially. Uh, friends betrayed him. Family betrayed him. And he understands what our burdens are this morning. He understands what we're going through. He can sympathize with that. And so he's having hard times in his ministry as he comes here to chapter 12. Uh, he's following the Father's will. He's got an ultimate purpose in his life. And yet he seems to be struggling uh, as the people around him begin to attack him. You see, Jesus had a purpose in his life. He had uh, a birth there in Bethlehem, although he's always been, because he's what? Jesus is God. And there been a time when Jesus was but he was, he was incarnated there in the seed of the Holy Ghost, not of man, born to a virgin. Uh, and he had his first heartbeat. He breathed his first breath just like you and I uh, have done. And he's headed towards the cross of Calvary. His ultimate purpose is to be obedient to the Father's will and to accomplish the purpose that he came here for. And he's going to take his last breath. His heart's going to beat for the last time. And he is going to die for you and I. He tasted death just like we're going to taste. He was a real man. He was enough man to die and bleed for you. He was enough God to save you from your sin. Amen. He was the God man. And you and I have a race to run just as Jesus had His race to run. I can't run your race. You can't run mine. If we was lining up in track, you've got your your alleyway there, you've got your lane there you have to run in and you can't come into my lane and run my race and vice versa. We both uh, start at a certain starting line and, and we have a finish line. And you're going to cross the finish line. Unless the Lord returns, you're going to cross the finish line. That's right. You're gonna, listen, you're going to breathe your last breath. All right. uh, and, and your heart's going to beat for the last time. And you're going to cross the finish line. It's all about Running well, though, isn't it? Right. Isn't that what it's all about? Uh, he gives us the first one. He'll give us the last breath. What about the in-between time? Have you ever thought about that? That's good. Galatians 5.7 says, You did run well. He was talking, Paul talking to the Galatians here. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? And so Paul was telling the Galatians there that there's going to be some hindrances to your race. And what are you going to do about that? So there's a beginning and there's an end. But what about the in-between? If you didn't have a mark in your Bible, I want you to look at verse 1 that we read there in chapter 12, in the meantime. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning, in the meantime. Jesus was being provoked. Uh, Jesus was being uh, attacked uh, in every way imaginable. But in the meantime, He just kept doing what He does. He just kept being Jesus, didn't he? He just kept being God. He just kept preaching. He just kept doing what He was supposed to do. He just kept being obedient. <clears throat> you know, I was saved. When I got saved, uh, I was born again. I experienced a spiritual resurrection. I was dead, completely dead. Sin was in my life. There was no hope for me. But I trusted in Jesus Christ and I had a spiritual resurrection just like Jesus Christ did. And I got a first heartbeat. I took my first steps of faith. I was a new creature in Christ and I began my walk of faith. And one day I'll have my last heartbeat and I'll take my last steps. And what about in the meantime? You know, in the meantime, listen, Jesus, He was often, He was sad and discouraged. But you know what He done in the meantime? He lifted people up. Listen, it was times when He was hurting and in pain. And he had no place to lay his head. You know what he did? In the meantime, he brought joy and peace to people all around him. Listen, he was times when he was hungry himself. He had nothing to eat. But in the meantime, he was a bread of life and he fed the multitudes. 
There was times when he was dusty and he's thirsty, and I'm sure he would have liked to stop, but in the meantime, he said, I'm going to give living water to everybody I can. Amen. Amen. What are you doing in the meantime? Between those two bookmarks of life and death. In the meantime, have you thought about that? <laughs> in the meantime. You know, Jesus, he, he died and bled for you right there at Calvary. But in the meantime, he paid the price for your sin. That's right. They took him down, they put him in a tomb, a barred tomb. It's barred because he wasn't going to keep it long. And they took him, and they thought all hope was gone when Jesus was in that tomb. The stone was rolled over, and they were discouraged, and they said, It's over with. But in the meantime, he was just defeating death, hell, and the grave. Amen. In the meantime, is there something you've been doing in the meantime? You discouraged this morning? How's your walk with Christ? I said, You've been saved. What have you been doing in the meantime? While you're waiting for him to come get you. That's good. In the meantime, Jesus just kept on being Jesus. Amen. What are we doing in the meantime? You making money? That's good. Provide for your family? You should. Enjoying life? Enjoying your hobbies? Enjoying all that? You should. And God's given us all kinds of things. He's made us rich. He's made us a a kingdom, a priestly kingdom, peculiar people. What are you doing in the meantime for Him? Amen. How many people are you telling Jesus about? Right. What are you doing in the meantime when you're waiting for His soon return? And then Jesus begins to preach to them in the meantime. He says, I want you to know something. I want you to know that I know about your character. Do you know what I'm saying? Verse 1, he says, Beware the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And he said, It won't be hid one day. In fact, he said, Everything that you said and done, he said, I'm going to take and go on to the housetop and I'm going to publish it before everybody. It's frightening, isn't it? <laughs> it is frightening. He said, There's nothing going to be hid that's not going to be revealed. He's talking about your character, not your reputation. Listen, my reputation is who you think I am. My character is who God knows I am. That's right. <laughs> There's a difference, isn't there? Yeah. Now, my ultimate goal is to make my reputation and my character kind of meet somewhere. Yeah. But I'm afraid my, at times our reputation is a little different from who we really are. Yeah. And sometimes our reputation, we just don't quite live up to it. But God knows our character, and there's a difference. Now, I may not know it. The word hypocrisy there, he... He's, he uses that word a lot to compare the Pharisees with people that are acting apart. That word hypocrisy is the Greek word for acting or for an actor. In other words, you remember those old movies uh, and they'd have their ball gowns on and stuff and they'd be on stage and they'd have a little stick with a little mask on it. That's what that word means. They wore a mask. In other words, they were trying to be something that they weren't. Right? Now I know you never do that. And I know I never do that, but let's just say the other people around us is doing that. <laughs> so let's not make it too personal. I mean, your pastor would never put on a mask and try to hide something that's really going on in his life, right? And you would never come to church and do that. And, and of course, I, I listen, there's never any time, listen, there's never a time when I'm down and I don't want to come to church and I don't want to preach. I'm always up. I'm always good. You don't believe that, do you? I don't believe that about you. Because we've got to be careful. But God knows what's going on in our lives. You know, He knows He loves the real stuff, doesn't He? First Corinthians 4 5 says, Wherefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and make manifest the counsels of the heart. Oh, every one of us ought to get down on our knees and cry out to God in fear right now. Yeah. I'm talking about not what you've done, but what you're thinking, what you ever thought. Uh, your, listen, the, the hidden things is what's going to be revealed. The things that we can hide with this old flesh, but they're not hid from Him. That's 2 right. Corinthians 4 2. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, 
This is Paul talking, not handling the Word of God deceitfully, but by the manifestation of the truth, committing ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God for the hidden things. It's easy, boy, it's easy to preach on the, the homosexuals, the prostitutes. Man, I can mean, yeah, I, I preach on that all day long, and the thief and the robbers, and, and it's amen, and boy, it's good to preach on that because we can all see that. But if we could, oh boy, I, I'm glad. I'm glad he's not pulled the curtain back on my mind this morning. Right. Right. And I'm glad he's never revealed all the hidden things on the rooftops. You ever have any pride in your life? Mm -hmm. mm. Yes, sir. Wow. How about envy yes. and strife? Yes. Oh, my, my. He oh, said, I don't know about your reputation, but I know your character. He said, in the meantime, you need to get your character right. You need to get your heart right in the meantime. Notice he uses the word leaven. Leaven in the Bible always speaks of corruption. Okay? It's something that's it's something that's bad. Okay? Leaven is not something that's good in the Bible. It's something that is bad in the Bible. It's, it's about destroying, it's about corruption. And, and you know where the first time you see the word leaven in the Bible? It's in the book of Genesis. Imagine that. The book of beginnings. You remember back in Genesis 19.3 and the angels pressed upon Lot greatly. And, and it says that they, they would not come into his house. And then it says there in verse 3, it says, And I pressed upon them greatly and they turned in unto him and entered into his house and he made them a feast and did bake unleavened bread. And they did eat. They wouldn't go in his house. And he said, Hold up, I'm going to bake some unleavened bread for you. Now what were they talking about there? See, Lot had corruption in his house. That's what it symbolizes. He had sin and corruption in his house to the point that even the angels of God said, we'd rather not go in there. I wonder when the angels, your angel, maybe my angel, maybe the, the ministering spirits. You believe in angels, don't you? Amen. They're ministering spirits. I wonder if they, they're ministering in my life and they look at my house and they say, we'll just wait out here until you come back out. Because you got something, you got some leaven in your house. Over in Exodus, when the law came in and the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, God said, I want you to go through your house and I want you to get every bit of leaven out of your house. There better not be a, a speck of leaven in your house. Because if there's any leaven in your house, listen, the angel of death is going to come by. You remember that night? What was all that about? He was talking about the house. He was talking. Notice that the first occurrences of leaven have to do with the house. Isn't that staggering? Yeah, staggering, ain't it? Because listen, when the house is not right, listen, your job's not right, your life's not right, and the church is certainly not right. And the first occurrences of those words deal with the house. What does that mean? To deal with the home. You better get our homes right. The preacher better get his home right. That's what he's saying there. Because listen, it's amazing that he uses leaven. He's the master storyteller. He's, a, he's the master. He? And he's the Word. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Nothing, listen, leaven is such an interesting word. A leaven, one thing it does is it puffs up. Do you know that? You ladies, like me, you like to bake. What <laughs> y'all laughing for? What y'all laughing for, Jay? Some of y'all got some stars. I was reading about starter for that sourdough bread and how some some ladies have kept it for like decades kept that starter going because leaven is yeast okay and jesus specifically said the yeast and the leaven for a reason and the reason is that leaven acts in the process of fermentation and leaven did you notice one thing about leaven is that it, pu it puffs that bread up right and you have little air pockets in it and the reason you have that in it is because the leaven's in there working. And the leaven, it eats sugar, okay? It eats all the good stuff out of the flour. Let me say that again. It takes care of all the good stuff. You didn't get that. It eats up all the good stuff in the flour and there's nothing left of the good stuff. Did you know that's what sin does in your life? Yeah. Well, it eats up all the good stuff, doesn't it? Yeah. That's what leaven does. It's a destroyer. And you notice that leaven is all in the air. It's right now, there's thousands of, uh, of yeast spores all in the air. Thousands of different kinds. And they're all through the air. And you know what they're looking for? They're looking up for a place to land where they can hunker down in and bed in. 
That's what the devil's doing. The Bible says he's a prince and the power of the air. And he's looking to kill, steal, and destroy. And he's looking for that home where he can go through the door preaching. That's what he's looking for. And that's what the leaven does. It just floats around until it sees a little flower there, a little place it can hunker down in, and some place that it can eat away and all the good stuff and destroy everything else. That's what leaven does. Y'all don't know I do that much about bacon like I do. <laughs> You know what leaven does? Leaven, this is how diabolical le leaven is. Leaven will get into something and eat all the good stuff. It eat all the sugar in you. And listen, you know what it produces? Not only does it produce the air, the carbon dioxide makes those bubbles, but it produces alcohol. All right? Oh, come on now. It produces alcohol. <clears throat> now, the reason it produces alcohol is because, you know why? So you can drink it and get drunk. No, that ain't like producing. It's not thinking about you drinking. Alcohol is toxic to all the other spores and organisms around the lab. In other words, it produces what kills them, but it doesn't hurt them. That's what sin will do. You can't hurt the devil. You're not hurting sin. Listen, your friends, listen, they love to get you into their sin. And listen, they love to see you go down, but it's not going to hurt them. You see? And that's what leaven does. It kills everything around it. Because it eats the good stuff and it produces the toxin that kills everybody. Sin kills everything around you. You get sin in your life, it won't be long it'll be killing your wife. Why, if you get sin in your life, it won't be long to be killing your husband, be killing your kids, and be destroying your family. That's what leaven does. He said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. He's warning you there. It puffs up, it kills. Leaven is diabolical. And Jesus, the master storyteller, He don't just pull this stuff. He knows what He's talking about. He's just not throwing words in there. You know what I got to look about leaven? Man, this is something that my jack off so <laughs> I was studying about old leaven in there and I was looking about all kinds of bacon recipes and stuff that I could try. <laughs> Two things that kill leaven. One of them is salt. Y'all didn't get that. <laughs> One of them is salt. Come on. Are you with me on that? One of, listen, you get enough salt out in your life, you be salt of the earth. Listen, you put a stop to leaven. You'll slow leaven down right in its tracks. Can't stand no salt. Listen, you get some salt in your life, that sin will start running away from you. Yeah. You know what else kills it? You know what stops that breath from growing higher and higher? The fire. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> the salt and the heat and the fire. You want a recipe for stopping that leaven in your life? You need some salt in your life. Yeah. You need some of this right here. Yeah. You need to put the heat on it. You want to put the heat on the devil and sin? That's right here. That's right here. Put the heat on. Right. It's a fire you up. And put the fire on him. He'll go to running. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the of the Pharisees. But not only did he say in the meantime, he said, "I know what's going on in your life." He said, "In the meantime, I want you to know that I care for you." Not only do I know you care for me, but I want you to know I care for you. Luke 12, 6 through 7 says, Are not five sparrows sold for two farms? And not one of them is forgotten before God, but even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. And that ain't no big deal for some of you. <laughs> for some of you, for some of you, it's a pretty big deal. Fear not, therefore, you are more valued than many sparrows. I'm sorry, I don't know why I said that. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> he said, here's what he said, are you glad? Listen, in Matthew 10, 29, I want you to notice this. Are not, he says in Matthew 10, 29, the Lord says this, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. And so both times he's talking about sparrows. He says two are sold for a farthing. A farthing, for the most part, is a penny. Okay? It's our penny. Now, remember this, you can't split a penny. You split a dime, two nickels, right? You split up a, a, a nickel, five pennies. 
But when we get right down to it, the penny is the one thing. You can't rip a penny into and give it to somebody. It ain't going to work. So two sparrows are sold for a penny. But in Luke, he says five sparrows are sold for two pennies. So what's going on there? The fifth sparrow is thrown in for free. Right? You with me on that? This is mad. This is serious mad. <laughs> two for one penny. Two more would be what? Four. Four, and that would be two pennies. But he throws in five for two pennies, okay? <coughs> what's the significance of that? Well, let me put it to you this way. You ever watch uh, those infomercials and they sell something like a garden hose? <laughs> and you can't kink it? It rolls up by itself. You can't take a stick of dynamite and blow it up. It's got enough pressure on it to knock a man down and to take paint off your house. In fact, if you don't even hook it up, it'll throw water out there. That's the kind of And if you'll buy it within the next 24 hours, they got a special price, $19.95. But if you buy it within the next couple hours, they'll throw two extra ones in for free. Now, why do they throw the two extra ones in for free? Because the first one ain't no camera. And the other two ain't going to be no camera. Right? And what he's saying is, listen, the, fish, the four sparrows all together ain't worth nothing. But the fifth one's even less than they are. None of them's any good. And he says, you're the fifth sparrow. <laughs> Who's the fifth sparrow? I am. And he says, listen, no one of them dies and falls to the ground. And I'm not there. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad of that? As a pastor, I've been besides a good bit of death being. I've seen people there and they're never going to get up from there. They'll be gone in a few hours. I've been there when they drew their very last breath and took their very last heartbeat. And you think, what's all this about? And I always think of that first. Fist prayer. He cares for this fist prayer. He's so tender and merciful to us. He loves us so much. It's, a thousand, it's estimated 100,000 hairs on an average person's head. An average middle-aged man's got 100,000. 75 of them fall out every day. He said, I know and have every one of them numbered. <laughs> he cares for you. He cares, I'm glad he cares for the fifth sparrow, ain't you? That's what else it says. And I'll close it here for a He says, not only does this our character, not only does he care, but he says, I'll give you courage to be a witness for me. You know why we're not witnesses? Because we fear, doesn't we? We fear what people might say. We fear what others might think of us. He said, listen, he says, don't worry about any of that. He said, when they bring you into the synagogues and under the magistrates and powers, take you no thought for how or what thing you shall answer or what you shall say, for the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what you ought to say. Now that's not for the pulpit. Don't come up here trying to preach and you wait for the Holy Spirit to anoint you and you ain't open your Bible to study. That's not what that's saying there. That's right. that right there is not for the pulpit, it's for the prison. Right. God will tell you what to say. God will help you. You ain't got to be a theologian or a great orator. But God will give you courage to be a witness for Him. That's why, I like, I, I, that's why we ought to be a witness wherever we go for Him. That's why baptism is so important. Why? Because you're a witness. And He'll strengthen you to do that. I can say more about that. We're about to run out of time to say this. Jesus is also concerned about us, about our priorities. Did you notice that last little bit I read you about the parable of the rich fool? <coughs> rich fool hit his priorities. Listen, the rich fool was a hard worker. As far as we know, he was a good guy. As far as we know, he had a good business mind. In fact, he'd be the kind of neighbor you'd want to have. He'd be the kind of man that you want your daughter to marry. There's nothing wrong with the rich man. He wasn't a fool for anything he was. But you'll notice when he started talking about talking to his soul, he was talking to his soul, and he used the word I six times. Like the, the possessive pronoun, he used I six times, he used mine five times in those few verses. And he was a fool for a lot of reasons. He never put God into calculation. He never worried about uh, the, the things of God. It was always, he was talking to his soul. 
And the odd part is that the only thing that had any value in his life was his soul. And his soul should have been talking to God instead of talking to himself. Because you'll tell your soul some wrong things if it's talking to yourself. But you know what the biggest part of the fool, you know what his biggest problem was? I think is he didn't understand time, did he? He thought he had so much time, didn't he? He thought he had so much time that he could do whatever he wanted and he'd have all these years to enjoy himself. He was a fool because he didn't understand time. The preciousness of time. He didn't understand he didn't have much left. In fact, he didn't know that tonight, this very night, his soul would be required of him. You know what time has to do with? The meantime we've been talking about. What have you done in the meantime? meantime. Maybe, you, maybe you've never trusted Jesus Christ. Listen, time's running out. Isn't it? I'm not trying to scare you. Listen, you're going to leave here and you're going to wake up in the morning, go to work, you're going to live your life. Uh, hey, that's what I tell all of us. I won't tell you time's going to run out on you. Maybe not today, maybe 20 years, maybe 40 years down the road. But I'm going to tell you, uh, it'll creep up on you and it'll be over with and that fool, your soul will be required of you this night. What are you doing in the meantime? How about those of you that say you had your first spiritual heartbeat, you had your first walks of step, and now you're waiting for Him to return for you either in death or the rapture? What are you doing in the meantime? In the meantime. In the meantime. I wonder if we just stand to our feet. What are we singing there? What's the last? What are we singing here? 479. 479. We're going to sing a few verses. 479. What is that? I should have looked. 479. Softly and tenderly. Sing a couple verses. Listen, in the meantime, what are you doing? Maybe you just need to come down here and say, Lord, I've wasted some of my time. I wonder if anybody in here is wasting a little bit of time. I want to tell you, time so precious. What are you doing in the meantime? Softly and tenderly. Boy, that's how he deals with the fifth sparrow. <laughs> Softly and tenderly. Maybe you just need to come down and have the Lord just put His arms around you and love on you a little bit. Deal with you softly. You're lost. Why don't you enjoy his soft and 
receiver membership. I want you to come forward. We're opening that up this, this morning. To anyone at all. Here it comes. We sing these last verses. church and membership they've already really been members they've really been here faithful uh, just now all year and they've just uh, they're just going to come and make that official uh, but in God's eyes they've just been so faithful we appreciate it uh, this is Charles and Gloria Stone they've been coming they've been dressed and I like that <laughs> this is uh, Mickey and Alan Mariska they've been so faithful to come they've been a blessing we're so glad to hear have them and, uh, this is Henry and Carlene and Elizabeth Toller they've been uh, uh, coming and uh, they, all these folks are so faithful. They do so much work around here, and, and uh, uh, we've got one here. Hey, girl, how you doing? <laughs> this, she don't she don't look as happy as you are. So. <laughs> and this is Sarah. And Sarah, of course, she's been here. Uh, she's faithful every time. Her piano, every time doors open, they're here. And so there's so many folks here that are going. We're just so happy to have them with us. Uh, they're so faithful. That's the kind of folks we want in our church. Amen. We want faithful people, and that's what they are. We love them. We appreciate it. So I'll make a motion for you to receive them into our family. I second the motion. All those in favor say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, if you got a problem with council outside of the state, <laughs> the church, you can see. So we're so glad uh, that they're a part of our church. And I'm going to 